Good morning. It's a privilege to be back, and I always enjoy coming down to this church. I've been in the ministry, have been for 48 years, and the more years that I was in the ministry, the more I realized that I was in spiritual warfare. Even when I was a missionary in Brazil, I realized in some new ways that being a Christian, just being a Christian, a born-again Christian, means that we are in spiritual warfare. We're in um, a world where Satan is trying to destroy people. He's very active, but God is more powerful, and God wants us to be victorious. So, as the longer I was in ministry, the more I realized that 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 1 to 6 is my ministry, as yours probably should be as well. So I'd like to read those six verses in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, 1 to 6. The Apostle Paul says, Therefore, since we have this ministry, as we have received mercy, we do not lose heart. But we have renounced the hidden things of shame, not walking in craftiness, nor handling the word of God deceitfully, but by manifestation of the truth, commending ourselves to every man's conscience in the sight of God. But even if our gospel is veiled, it is veiled to those who are perishing, whose minds the God of this age has blinded, who do not believe, lest the light of the gospel of the glory of Christ, who is the image of God, should shine on them. For we do not preach ourselves, but Christ Jesus the Lord, and ourselves, your bond servants, for Jesus' sake. For it is the God who commanded light to shine out of darkness, who has shone in our hearts, to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. So we are in, in a war, a spiritual war. And it takes place in three different places. First of all, in our minds. Satan tries to put thoughts in our minds that we need to realize when they are from him and defeat them. Then it is in our emotions. The lust of the flesh and, and the desires of the flesh, we have to war against them. Then it is in our will, our will, that we learn to be obedient to the word of God and obedient to God's word and Christ himself. Well, how wonderful it is that we have weapons. We have weapons as God's people to fight against evil in our world, and he gives us seven in this passage in, in Ephesians chapter 6. And, um, and so, when I, the longer I was in the ministry, the more I realized I needed prayer. I needed the prayer of other people. And I thank God for over the years for a mother who prayed for me. She faithfully prayed for me from the time I was born until she passed away in 2004. 2004, that's four, 12 years ago. When she passed away, I realized that I lost a very important person in my life, especially in my ministry, because her prayer support was awesome. And so there's a song. That I've been learning lately by Dottie Rambo. Dottie Rambo was a gospel singer and a writer who was killed in a bus accident several years ago. And uh, she wrote a lot of songs, and I played their records over the years, the, this family, the gospel group. And uh, recently, I started singing one of their songs, and I trust that I'll do okay. <laughs> you pray for me as I sing. I've been practicing it, and uh, I've been playing guitar and so forth since I was 10 and had a gospel group for a number of years. But this song, I might become emotional because it's about my mother. 
My mother was a prayer support. I looked upon the hillside where mother had been laid. I saw the love, the flowers they placed upon her grave. And there alone beside her, I bed began to weep. I thought about the many times my mother prayed for me. My mother prayed for me and taught me right from wrong. Of her I have sweet memories, although from me she's gone. Her earthly life has ended, her bodies need the sun. The doors of life for mama past, she's at her home with God. The winter snow has fallen upon my mother's grave. The flowers once so lovely have weathered all away, but still there's precious memories of her in bygone days. I'll never forget the many times I heard my mother pray. My mother prayed for me and taught me right from wrong. Of her I have sweet memories, although from me she's gone. Her earthly life has ended, her body's neath the sun. The toils of life for mom have passed, she's at her home with God. The toils of life for mom have passed, she's at her home with God. have a very important part in the life of your children because praying for your children I pray for my grandchildren I pray for my two daughters that God has given to me and I realize that we're living I think in the last days very last days we can see a lot of things happening in our world can we not that cause us concern but at the same time we know that God has a plan, and we know we're going to be on the victory side, right? So when you look at Ephesians chapter 6, we see this chapter is dedicated to spiritual warfare. And um, starting at verses 10 and 11, we notice that the Apostle Paul says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles, the trickeries, the deceptions of Satan. Now, I'm 75 years old now, and I've lived a life for God since I became a Christian at 15. 
And I'm so thankful that I've had the privilege to serve him. But we still have opportunity to serve him as long as we have breath. As long as God gives us opportunities to let his light shine in us and through us. Well, when I first went to Brazil in 1969, March of 1969, I'd been a missionary six years after that, and um, I learned a couple of things as soon as I got there. Everything was different. The language was different. The food was different. Culture, practices, ways of living were different. But there were Christians there. There were about five million of them as the, back in 1968. Today, there's 55 million Christians in Brazil. The fastest growing church in the world, except maybe from South Korea, maybe. <laughs> But the fact of it is, I learned a lot of things while I was there. And um, I had been there a number of months, and then my first Christmas in Brazil, I was asked to stay in a, in a, in a family's house in Sao Paulo, where the Ford Company had a large plant in, in Brazil, and still do. One of the men that worked for the Ford Company in Brazil and he and his wife always came back to America for a week during Christmas. So he asked me to stay in his house during that week. It was a large house, beautiful house. It had running hot water and all that, you know. <clears throat> and so the first night I sat in, in the room with this guitar and I was strumming it. And I was afraid because around all the houses they had walls, broken glass on top of the walls. All of the windows and the doors were all had bars. People were afraid of thieves breaking into their house. That's why I was asked to stay in this house for that whole week. I was just learning Portuguese and, uh, and um, so the first night that I stayed in this house, I didn't, I couldn't sleep. So I just sat in the room and I played gospel songs by memory and played my guitar and prayed. It was a little bit after midnight when the, the house across the street, a shot, a, a bullet shot rang out and screaming and hollering rang out across the street. And I went to the big window and I looked and a thief was try, had tried to get into the house and they caught him. But the man in the house got shot through his shoulder. Now think about this. The house I was staying in was much bigger than the one across the street, but because I was playing my guitar, singing gospel songs, the thief couldn't come into, that, into the, my house, the house I was staying in. So I knew why God had kept me awake that night. So the next day, I walked across the street. I had gotten some street and I mean some sleep, and I talked to the family that lived there. The gentleman had been taken to the hospital, and he had been giving uh, medical help for this bullet that had gone through his shoulder. And of course, they caught the thief, and. Um, and so I was thinking, now I have an, another six days to stay in this house by myself. So every night, I would stay awake and play the guitar until I got so sleepy that I would fall asleep. But I had fear in my heart. I was afraid. Have you ever been afraid? So finally, I said to the Lord, I said, Lord, take away this fear. Give me confidence that you're going to protect me, that you're going to, your presence will be near me. And it says in this, in this passage to be strong in the Lord. It's a command. So when we have experiences that cause us to have to depend on God, that's good. That's an opportunity for us to grow and become strong in our faith. 
Now when you look at verse 12, for example, we notice that we do warfare with various demonic forces. They're well organized. They're as well organized as any other group other than God's people. So we look at verse 12, we notice, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. We are surrounded by forces, both of darkness and of light. The good, the good angels outnumber the bad ones, and I thank God for that. But there's enough of the bad demonic forces in our world that they're doing a lot of bad things, a lot of chaos, causing a lot of trouble for us. So the warfare in our mind is that we need to believe God and not to fall prey to the deceptions of Satan. And when Satan tries to get us away from his truth and from his word, we need to do battle against that. To me, the biggest deception in America today and in the world is when people can think that they can live without God. That they can do okay without God. And, and I would have to say, probably, might be wrong, maybe the majority of the people in America today think they can do that. Maybe, I don't know. What, 75, 80% say they're Christians? Or they identify themselves as being Christians? But the deception is when Satan can get us to think that we can live our lives without God's help. And then what happens? When we get to the place where we can't anymore live our lives by ourselves, then and many times only then do people come to God for help. So when we go to doing warfare with the, uh, the armor of God, we see there's seven weapons. If you could turn with me to Ephesians chapter 6, starting at verse 13. It says, Therefore take up the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and having done all to stand. Stand therefore, having girded your waist with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness. And so we know that the truth comes from the Word of God. And then when we apply the Word of God in our lives, we're going to become righteous people. Not our righteousness, but the righteousness of God. And then people are going to see that we're different and that we are not like the people of the world. You see, the danger is when Christians don't act differently than the worldly people. You follow me? But when we follow the word of God, we're going to be so different from the worldly people. And the one way we can demonstrate it is when there's trouble in our lives, we can face the trouble and we can let God help us in our times of trouble, you see. And isn't it wonderful that these are the weapons that he gives to us. He gives us the weapon of truth, the word of God, the breastplate of righteousness. His righteousness becomes our righteousness. We become godly in our lives, not because of us, but because of him living within us and dwelling within us. And then also, as we go about, we have feet that march and walk in everyday life. What do we do? We take the gospel of peace to the people in the world. To the people in the world. Today we have what we call a community party on my street where I live, near Skipback. Today there's going to be over a couple hundred people are going to get together, have a party, lots of food, alcohol, and music. And all the neighbors in our neighborhood are invited, plus their friends. I've been going to these parties all the years that I lived there, 34 years on that street. And I've gotten to know the people in our community. And when somebody is not a Christian and they die or go to the hospital, guess what happens? They call me. Those who don't have a church, they say, oh, well, we have a community parson and he can help us. 
So when somebody dies on my street, sometimes I have a funeral. And I have opportunity to talk about Jesus. I can't tell lies. I can't tell them that this person is in heaven because I know better. But you know something? We have many, many opportunities to share our faith with our relatives, with neighbors, with people we meet. Every time I go into a store to shop or some place, and I go and I meet people and I get the opportunities to talk with them. Sometimes I have opportunities to even pray with people, strangers. And some pastors say to me, how come you have the boldness to approach people or strangers and share your faith? I said, because that's in my heart. Because of what Jesus did for me in 1956, he saved my life. He completely transformed my life. If I hadn't been changed by God's power, I would have ended up in prison with, and the people that I've ministered to now for 42 years in prisons. I can identify with them because my life was a mess. Even at 15, Jesus completely changed my life. That's why I want to tell everybody I can. And then he gives us faith. He gives us a shield of faith to believe God, to have complete confidence in him and his word. And they protect us. This shield of faith protects us from the fiery darts of Satan. Where Satan tries to put doubts in our minds. And we say, get away. I don't, I don't want those doubts. And I'm going to have victory over those doubts. Then there's the helmet of salvation. Once we get Jesus in our hearts, in our lives, in our minds... We are protected by him. He puts a hedge of protection around us. We don't have to be afraid. I did 20 years of ministry in Philadelphia, street ministry. There were times when it was not safe. We'd go into the worst areas of Philadelphia. Did it with pocket testimony, the same type of ministry I did in Brazil. And many times, um, we were in danger. But you know something? We have a hedge of protection around us. We don't have to be afraid. And when we're in, the, in our cars and we're driving, we can have confidence. I can't tell you how many times I just missed having accidents. Driving all over southern Brazil, all over America. Guess what? And I say this carefully, knowing that it's God that did it. I've never had, and I say it carefully, I've never had a real accident. And I say that with you to keep it under your hat. <laughs> because I know it's possible. Accidents happen to everybody. But if God protected me because I constantly prayed for his safety. Now, and last but not leastly, we come to the ministry of prayer. We talked about the sword of the Spirit as being the word of God. And then we come to verse 18 through 20. Here Paul says, praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit, being watchful to this end with all perseverance and supplication for all the saints. And for me, that utterance may be given to me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel. For which I am an ambassador in chains, that in it I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. Here was Paul saying that the ministry of prayer, it may be last on the list, but in a sense probably the most important weapon that we have. Some of these weapons are defensive and others are to uh, be bold and aggressive with our faith. Well, I've had the privilege of getting to know a lot of different people over the years. And um, when I started going into uh, Montgomery County Prison in 1975, there was a young man by the name of Bob Stevenson who um, was from Atlanta, Georgia. Bob Stevenson was 
a teenager who grew up in a Christian home. But he rejected what he had been taught. He became one of the biggest drug dealers in Atlanta. He went to um, federal prison in Atlanta, did five years. A ministry in, the, in this particular prison in Atlanta, Georgia, had a prison ministry and they went around giving prisoners Bibles. Now, things have changed over the years in prison ministry. There's a lot of prisons now who do not allow us to distribute Bibles freely. They have to buy them. Prisoners have to pay for them. But some of the prisons still allow us to give out Bibles freely. Well, there was a ministry in Atlanta, and um, they let the Bible in Bob's cell. He opened up the Bible and began to read it, and got saved, became a Christian. Did five years, and he had a praying mother. His mother prayed for him, still does. So he came up in 1975 to go to college, Bible college, Valley Forge Christian College. While there, he said, where can I go into prison and do prison ministry? Is there anybody who knows anything about it? Yeah, there is. They said there's a place uh, called Glenn Oliver and somebody else. So he came and he contacted me and started going into the prisons with me. Greater Ford and Philadelphia prisons and others. That was during the 80s. Bob Stevenson graduated from Valley Forge Christian College. Got to know a young lady there, a Christian young lady, and got married. God called him to go to Mexico as a missionary. He's been in Mexico now since the mid-80s. He has a church of 10,000 people near Mexico City. He's one of the best preachers I ever heard in my life. A young man who had rejected Christ growing up, messed his life up, and then came around and became a, one of the, can I say, one of the best preachers I've ever known, and there are a lot of good ones. You have a good one, I'm, and there's a lot of them. And uh, Bob Stevens became a, he'll never leave Mexico, became a citizen of Mexico. His children are, they consider Mexico their country, so to speak, because God called them there. <clears throat> but Bob Stevenson <clears throat> is a powerful messenger who uh, I think He's going to be rewarded tremendously one day. But I could just go on and on and on and tell you about different ones that I've known over the years. It's been a joy to see God do things in people's lives. I pray, for example, for this church, that God will bless you in your ministry here and that people will come to Christ through this work, through, through this ministry. And that God will use you in many ways as you reach out and do spiritual warfare. I don't know what you think, but uh, I think, personally, I think that the churches are beginning to wake up in America. And they're beginning to see that many were mis not doing something right along the way, and that we need to call on God for revival in America, for spiritual awakening in our country. And a lot of us believe that that's going to happen. But nevertheless, here we are. Here it is, 2016. I never cease to be amazed what I see happening in the world. Um, my son-in-law is from Egypt, and uh, my little grandchildren, I call them my little Egyptians. His family and relatives live in Egypt. And he said, 
that the church in Egypt is being persecuted tremendously. Because as we know, we can see the church is being persecuted in the Middle East. And I look at my little grandchildren and I say, can you imagine there's people who live in the Middle East who are being slaughtered for their faith? And I look at my grandchildren, what kind of world are they going to have 10 years from now, 20 years from now? But guess what? One of these days, guess who's coming back? Jesus is going to split open the sky, and he's going to come back. Now, I don't know if I'll see that in my lifetime. I'm asking the Lord for another 20 years. If he gives it to me, if, if, if our world's still standing for 20 years. But the fact of it is, I'm looking for good things to happen. So every day, every day when I get up, I ask, Lord, use me as a vessel dedicated to letting your light shine through me wherever I go. Father, we thank you today. Thank you so much for these, your people. Father, I pray that you would bless the pastor and that you would bless the leaders and bless the people here, Lord. Lord, continue to use us. Use this church, Lord, to bring honor and glory to your name. Thank you for the families that you have given to us, for the friends, for the family of God, for your word. And I pray that you would just continue to lead us and guide us and we'll give you the praise in Jesus' name. Amen.